Alfred Lunt in The Gentleman from the Islands, an original radio play on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, the Cavalcade Playhouse is especially proud to welcome for his first sponsored appearance on the air the celebrated American actor Alfred Lunt. The play he has chosen for this event tells the story of a gallant and courageous gentleman from the islands of the West Indies whose destiny it was to secure the unity of a great republic. The gentleman's name was Alexander Hamilton. Our play, written by Robert Tallman, encompasses 24 fateful days days that were to bring death to Alexander Hamilton and to his country, a legacy beyond price. The DuPont Company presents Alfred Lunt as Alexander Hamilton in The Gentleman from the Island on the Cavalcade of America. Midnight, the night of June 17th, the year 1804. Over the Grange, country estate of Alexander Hamilton on Manhattan Island, the moon rides high. Up the lane to the mansion house, silhouetted sharply against the moonlit shrubs, rides a man on horseback. He draws up before the portico, dismounts and tethers his horse. In a few quick strides, he is standing before the lighted French windows of the master's study. He looks about him, then raises his crop and raps on the pane. The man inside rises from the desk to answer the door. Who is it? I have the honor to call upon you, General Hamilton, on behalf of a friend. May I come in? Why, Mr. Vaness, at this time of night? Come in, sir. Thank you. I trust I do not disturb your household at this hour, sir. The friend I have the honor to wait upon is most impatient. Well, sit down. Sit down. Cigar? Brandy? Thank you, though. This letter, General Hamilton, if you will be so good as to read it. Must I now? I think you'd better. Well, if you insist. Hand me the letter opening there, will you, sir? At your service, General. Thank you. Excuse me? Sit down. Sit down. Be comfortable. Thank you. I prefer to stand. <laughs> this letter is from Aaron Burr. I recognize the hand. That is correct, General. But I don't understand. He seems to be agitated about some newspaper story. You knew nothing of it? No, sir. I never read scandal-mongering journals. Apparently your friends do. But this concerns something a Dr. Cooper says I said two years ago. You deny having said it? That Aaron Burr is a dangerous man not to be trusted with the reins of government? That is only the published utterance, General Hamilton. Colonel Burr has reason to believe that in private you have sought to place him in an even more despicable character. Mr. Vaness, despicable and more despicable is not worth the pains of distinction. Then you accept the challenge. All right, Colonel Burr, a letter. I don't believe in acting in haste, and I don't understand perfectly as yet what Colonel Burr's motive is in this affair. It couldn't be that you are afraid to meet with Colonel Burr on the field of honor, sir? Field of honor? I couldn't meet Aaron Burr on the field of honor. He wouldn't know where to find such a field. You may tell Colonel Burr that he can wait upon my pleasure. It is not my custom to receive wild challenges to my honor in the middle of the night. Not so wild as you think, sir. Then beg your friend to tell me why, why, after all these years of political rivalry between us, he has chosen this night to resolve the matter. I have retired from public life to all intents and purposes. Is a man who takes the power at the age of 25 retired 47, sir? You belittle yourself, sir. That is my privilege, Mr. Vaness. I bid you good night, sir. As you wish, General Hamilton. Good night, sir. Alexander? That's it? James? We didn't mean to disturb you, Father. Mother was worried and called me. Alexander, I, I was certain I heard a horse in the drive. James thought he heard it, too. 
That's absurd. You've been dreaming, both of you. Who was it, Father? Now, what have I done to deserve this, my wife and my eldest son, doubting my word? Now, don't blame James, my dear. I made him come with me. I had such a strange feeling. Foreboding, almost. But here you are, still at your death. Forgive me. If you tell the truth, I'm glad you came downstairs. I must go into the city tonight. Tonight? Well, when did you decide about that? Just now. Father, someone was here. Why don't you want us to know about it? Good heavens, I've been away from home before. Anyway, James is old enough to look after things. I can't bury myself here in the country, you know. Why must you go tonight? I had dared hope you have done with politics. The business that takes you away from us like this so abrupt. I might have been president now if I'd stayed in politics. Would you like that? No. The president's a passing fancy. That was never for you. The Constitution was your work, and that's something that's good for all time. Yes, if it stakes. Was there ever any doubt about that? I doubted it once. Now I don't know. That's why I'm going to the city, Betsy. I have to find out. Tonight. <laughs> Can't be long. Now what in thunder? Hamilton. Come in. Come in. I I'll make a light. I know the hour's late, Judge Pendleton, but... but think nothing of it. I just dozed off in my chair, as you see. You saved me a bad case of stiff joints. <clears throat> yeah, that's better. Now, what brings you out at this hour? I just had a visit from Mr. Vaness, the so-called Affair of Honor. On whose behalf? Colonel Aaron Burr. I trust you didn't do him the honor of noticing his challenge. Not yet. You intend to do so? I might. You mustn't consider it. Burr is a deadly shot. This wouldn't be his first duel, you know. But it would be my first duel. First performances have a way of sticking in the public mind. Precious little comfort that would be if it were your last as well. I'm not so sure of that, Judge Pendleton. Why this concern over Burr, whom you've always held beneath contempt? Because I have reason to believe there is more to his challenge than meets the eye. Don't forget, Judge Pendleton, I'm not a bad shot myself. Burr doesn't gamble for little stakes. If it were only his personal honor at stake, he would have challenged me long ago, for I have never made any secret of my contempt for the man and all he stands for. Oh, don't forget, Hamilton, you have time and again frustrated Burr's highest ambitions. When he wanted to be president, you chose Jefferson instead. And only last month, you killed his chances of becoming governor of New York. He'd set his heart on that governor's chair. Ah, but why did that governor's chair mean so much to him? That's what I must make sure of, Pendleton. If the answer is what I think it is... Supposing you fought this duel, Hamilton. Supposing you killed Aaron Burr. You'd only make him a martyr. Ah. But if Burr killed me, what then? It's unthinkable. This whole thing is unthinkable, Hamilton. It must not happen, this duel. Judge Pendleton, of what must happen and what must not happen, neither you nor I can be the arbiters. Tomorrow I shall see Burr's political crony swart out. What good will that do? Good if he tells me the story I think he will. Well, there is always a final decision which no man makes for himself. <laughs> listening to Alfred Lunt in an original radio play, The Gentleman from the Islands, on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. As our play continues, Alexander Hamilton, played by Alfred Lunt, is in the headquarters of the Society of St. Tammany, talking with one of New York's first political bosses, a gentleman by the name of Swarthout. Let us be realistic, Mr. Swarthout. You know perfectly well that without my support, your party cannot elect Colonel Burr or anyone else to the governorship now or ever. 
So, now we know why you opposed Colonel Burr's election as governor. Wanted the job for yourself, eh? I haven't said so. Oh, come now, come now. You're a man of the world, Hamilton. As plain as the nose on your face that you want. Excuse me, Mrs. Wartout. I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, the gentleman was most insistent. What gentleman? Speak up. Uh, uh, Mr. Cheatham, sir. Bring him in, bring him in. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till Cheatham sees you here. I wager yes, he'll... You'll he'll... wager what, Mr. Swarthout? Mr. Cheatham, I believe you have met General Hamilton. We've met. I hadn't dreamed we'd meet again. Perhaps you've been dreaming of other things, Mr. Cheatham. Uh, General Hamilton has decided to let bygones be bygones. Isn't that so, General? I haven't said so. No. <laughs> I assure you, Mr. Cheatham, General Hamilton is only waiting to find out what we have to offer him. Huh? Well, is that so? Gentlemen, let's come to the point. It has been suggested that the office of Governor of New York might have its attractions for me. I needn't tell you that I resigned from public office once because it didn't pay. Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America. Couldn't make it pay. What you need is counsel, young man. Well, I'm willing to listen to your proposition, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Willing to listen? <laughs> what do you think of that, Cheatham? Willing to listen? But when we tell you what we have in store for you, you may think at first your ears have been deceiving you, Hamilton. Well, get on with it. Uh, are you quite certain of our ground here, Swartout? Uh, Mr. Cheatham, you let me handle this in my own way. Hamilton, here's the story. Our friends in New England have taken Colonel Burr into their confidence. They plan that New England and New York shall secede from the Union. Secede from the Union? Are you serious? Indeed we are serious. And what's more, I am confident that the French minister has assured Colonel Burr that France will back us up with all the military power she has. And when Napoleon's agent says that... When Napoleon's minister says that, beware, you will be his next victim. Would, uh, would that be so unpleasant? Napoleon is realistic, and so are we of the manufacturing states of this country. Jefferson is bound and determined to ruin our foreign trade all for the sake of a vague, romantic notion he calls democracy. Well, we can't compete with a disciplined, organized nation like Napoleon's France under such a system. And so you propose that we should play his game, hmm? Just so. You begin to see the possibilities, my boy? I do. Ah? And I have just this to say... A more evil, scurrilous, rotten, treacherous scheme has never come to my attention. Swine. That's what you are. Filthy swine. May God forgive the American people for ever having allowed men like you to be born on the soil of a free nation. Do you think the unity of this vast continent is subject to the whim of your little corrupt thirst for power? I tell you it is not. And never shall be. And just how do you propose to stop us, General Hamilton? With my life, if need be. My life is a little thing compared to the future of the unity of the United States. How my name goes down in history is a matter of small moment. How this great nation survives in history means everything. <laughs> repast, my dear Mistress Hamilton, and music with the feast. I have never dined so royally. I held out against the musicians as long as I could, such an extravagance. But Alexander would have it. James, when you're the head of the house, I adjure you, do not follow your father's example. You see the thanks one gets for a generous gesture, from the women at least, and the women, it's they we strive to please after all. Don't be deceived, Father. Mother loves it. She told me so before dinner. Now, you're too old to be carrying tales, James. But it's true, Alexander. 
It's wonderful to see you so full of the enjoyment of life. Oh, one would think I had done nothing but add columns of figures for lo, these 20 years. And today is an exception. It's the 4th of July, you know, but no brandy. You'll be drinking toast till morning, I suppose, at the celebration in town. I certainly hope so. Well, I wouldn't have you miss it for the world. Aaron Burr will be there for certain, and I want everybody to see how much handsomer you look in your dress uniform. Aaron Burr will be there. Of course, isn't he always? Why? What's the matter? Nothing. Just, I'll have to polish up my speech. Well, Pendleton, let's be getting on. Good night, Father. Good night, Judge Pendleton. Good night, my dear. Hurry home. And drink a toast to General Washington for us. Two toasts. A dozen. Well, my boy, so you've decided. Yes. You'll be my second in this affair, sir. You know I can refuse you nothing. You remembered to bring my papers. Thank you. You saw Swata? I saw two swine. And I smelt the filth of the pig pen the third sent his challenge from. Have you considered you leave a wife, children? There are things that mean even more to me, Judge Pendleton. I see. And another thing, you must pledge our adversaries to keep this matter secret. No one must have an inkling of it. I want my last days with my family to be happy. Hamilton, please. No, no. My mind's made up. You shall see. They will be the happiest days of my life. you home earlier than we expected. I'm very much obliged to you, sir. You were magnificent, Hamilton. The way you face Burr as if nothing had happened between you at all. Nothing has happened yet. I spoke to Van Ness in the course of the evening. July 11th is the date. At Weehawken Heights, across the Hudson. The New Jersey laws on dueling are more liberal. July 11th. And this is the 4th. The fifth now, six days. Well, good night, Judge Pendleton. Good night. And God bless you. Why, Betsy, still uh, up? I, I found these papers here. I've been reading them. Well, that's a woman's privilege, my dear. Such a lot of papers. Oh, it seems as you... You must have been writing letters or making speeches 24 hours a day for the past 15 years. How did we ever find time to be in love with each other? That was easy. Thank you, sir. I'm learning all your secrets. Oh, here's one. Remember this? The letter I wrote to old Cheatham after that scurrilous story he printed about our marriage? I'll wager his ear is still burning. Gall of the man. Intimating that I married you for your money. Well, didn't you? Of course. But that's our business. Well, then, I'm glad I had some money. Do you really mean that, Betsy? What do you think? Oh, forgive me, my dear. These old memories, we've dig up how rich they are and how many things we've learned, especially me. Oh, here's the letter from General Washington after you quarreled, remember? Oh, yes, I remember. He said I kept him waiting. I stopped to talk to Lafayette on the stairs. It couldn't have been more than two minutes, but General Washington insisted it was ten. Naturally, I had to stand on my honor. You had too much honor in those days. I like you better now. Perhaps I haven't changed. As much as you think, Betsy. Why do you say that in that strange tone of voice? Alexander, what is it with you these past weeks? Have I seemed not like myself? Too much like yourself. Your old self, I mean. This elation. I remember you like this before when you were going to Philadelphia to stand up against your elders for a constitution you wanted. I survived it, didn't I? Yes, and I prayed for your safety every night. Oh, you were so outspoken. There were so many hot-headed men there, the kind that fight a duel at the drop of a hat. Uh, what is it, Alexander? Did I say something to offend you? No. 
No, of course not. Just remembering old times. Too much of it for one day. Sometimes I feel I've known you so little for all our years together. Yet I'm glad. You've never seemed so human, so alive. I've never loved you as I have these past weeks. They've been the happiest weeks of my life. Say that again, Betsy. The happiest weeks of my life. You do mean it, don't you? Oh, thank you. And now I'll say good night again, my dear. I have a little writing to do before I come to bed. Good night, my love. Father, may I come in for a moment? Why, James, are you up too? Yes, I waited up. I wanted to talk to you without Mother here. Secrets from your mother? I'm flattered. Well, I... I'm preparing for my regents' examinations now to enter college, as you know, and I thought... Well, I wasn't sure whether I'd be going. I mean, are you getting ready to leave us, Father? What on earth put that idea into your head? This letter. You left it out on the desk. I wouldn't have looked except for what it says on the top. To my sons, in the event that I should not return. Have you showed that to your brothers? No. I wanted to be sure what it meant. Well, it doesn't mean anything. I was thinking of taking a fairly long trip, perhaps to Canada, naturally. If I went by boat, there's some danger. You're lying to me, Father. Yes, perhaps I am. Are you going to fight a duel? You know I don't approve of dueling. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you were going to fight a duel. No, we'll put it this way. If I were, I'd want you to do as I said in that letter. Look after your mother when I'm gone. I understand, Father. And don't worry. I won't say anything to Mother. Not till it's all over. You're a great gentleman, James. I have no fears for you. Be a guide to your younger brothers and a comfort to your mother. I'll do my best. Now, good night. I've work to do. God bless you, my son. Goodbye, Father. Good luck. Ten paces, gentlemen. Ten paces. Ten paces. One, two, three, four... Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that satisfactory to you, Judge Pendleton? That will do. Mark the place. Now then, do I have the honor? Very good, sir. I choose heads. Heads it is. General Hamilton, your choice of weapons. Thank you. This one will do. Colonel Burr, I have the honor. Well, let's get on with it. At your service, sir. Stand, sir, gentlemen. Are you ready, Doctor. Ready, gentlemen. Very well, gentlemen. Present. Fire! Oh. Doctor, Colonel Hamilton, he's hit. Oh, why does he hold his fire like General that? General Hamilton. General Hamilton, can you speak? Please, sir, I'm the doctor. Let me get at that wound at once. It's too late, doctor. This is a mortal wound. Looks bad. We'll have to get him across the river some way to a hospital. A bullet has entered his lung. Gentlemen, bring a stretcher. Over here with a stretcher. Hurry. Oh, just a moment. Before we start. I should die before we reach the other shore. Let my wife be called at once. Break it to her gently. But impress upon her that I have meant that she should understand why I have done this. The papers must be published. Just as I left them. Tell her this is my legacy to her. And to my country. Oh, listen to him. He doesn't know what he's saying. Must have been mad these last days. Why else did he hold his fire? The suicide brought on my madness. Brought on my madness, yes. Well, whose madness? Does one argue with a dead man? For I am dead. But not half so dead as Aaron Burr shall be before ever death touches his body. 
God give him the strength to go on until his every intrigue shall be shown for what it is. Shall we lift him up, Doctor? He's quiet now. Yes, gentlemen, lift him. Lift him up. Now, wait. Oh, please, one moment. Yes, General Hamilton. My pistol. Be careful how you handle it. It might go off and do harm. It hasn't been fired, you know. And now the star of tonight's cavalcade, Alfred Lunt. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It has been nearly a century and a half since Alexander Hamilton sacrificed himself that our country might continue the course charted by the founders of this republic. It is my sincere hope that in our play tonight there has been some measure of inspiration and encouragement for the gallant men and women who today are fighting to destroy the evil forces once more abroad over the earth. Thank you. On the Cavalcade of America, the distinguished character actor, Dean Jagger, in a new and thrilling radio play called Man of Iron, a story of John Erickson's invention of the monitor. Don't forget, next week, Dean Jagger as John Erickson in Man of Iron. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Don Voorhees. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from DuPont. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>